Hey, this is Passy from Passy's World of ICT, the guy with the white hat. And we're continuing with this uh, login password system we've been making, and this is going to be the administration function, but it's going to be part one because this has uh, got a lot of components in it, a lot of things to build and test. And so it'd be like a really long video if we did the whole thing in one go. So we're going to do it in parts one and part two part one this week and then part two next week. Now, because it is such a long video, we suggest that what you do is go to the uh, YouTube player and on that tool cog, click on that and set the speed to 1.5x or to 1.75x. And I promise my voice won't go all chipmunky and fast. It actually keeps the um, tone really good in uh, YouTube and works quite okay. So we suggest you do that. So this lesson, we're going to build the login system admin screen. All right. So what we'll get built is this new screen, which we're adding on to our existing program we've been building in the last two lessons. And up the top here, you're going to be able to look at the people who have applied to join the tennis dream team in kind of a spreadsheet type view. And that's called a data grid view. And then in this second area down the bottom, the people that are already registered onto the system and can log on already, uh, which we saw in previous lessons like Barry and Shazza, and of course the administrator, you'll be able to flick through these records uh, in a data table down here, which we've kind of put into a form view. So this first data table up here is in data grid view. This one is kind of like in a form view. All right. So we're going to set all that up and get it working. Uh, the save buttons, the add new buttons, all those sorts of things, we'll set them up in the part two lesson. All right, so part one, we're just going to get this screen built, get the data tables built and get it displaying. All right, so in the top part there, we've got the applicants.xml data and in the bottom part, we've got the user details.xml. So we'll be using those two files as input. So you need to have done the two previous lessons and have those files from the last lesson where we built the user application form. You need the files that were finished at the end of that lesson and that whole um, program and application from that lesson because we're going to add on to it in this admin part one lesson. So there's quite a few things to do. We're going to add on that login system administration screen, which you saw there step by step. We're going to link that admin screen to the existing application front end. Uh, now we'll be using the Visual Basic Net IDE, the interface development environment to create a data set and data table for the applicants XML file. We did already did this kind of work in the writing XML lesson, uh, which I think was about three lessons ago. And so we're going to use the uh, actual panels on the interface development environment. You can do it all by program code, but we like to use the panels so you can see exactly what's going on. And we're also going to use those panels to make a data table for the user details XML file as well. So we'll be making two data sets and two data tables. One of them, the applicants one, will put into data grid view whereas the user details one will put into data set form view. That's going to be the one that's at the bottom of the screen, which we just looked at. And some issues are going to come up involving XML namespace. And so we're going to go into XML namespace and delve uh, into XML files a bit deeper and sort out those issues and do some retro kind of fitting back into the programs which you've already made. And on those program, you saw the navigation bars where we can flick through the records and do saves and deletes and adds. We're actually going to build a customized one of those uh, for the bottom form as well. So this will all be kind of going deeper into the binding source navigation bar as well, which we introduced, I think, back in the writing XML lesson. So there's a lot in here and you need to have completed those other lessons uh, before you do this lesson. OK, so you can't really jump into this lesson because you won't have all those previous components and you will not have uh, all the experience necessary for this lesson either. OK, so the password admin form, uh, we have to build those data tables onto it, which takes quite a few steps. So when we first set it up, we're just doing project add windows form. So we're loading up what we finished with at the end of the add new applicant lesson. And we're just doing project add windows form and create a new form called admin form. So this should be very familiar to you from the previous lessons. And on that admin form, we're just going to have a uh, 
a heading and just one little label there at the moment okay just to start off with so this is what we're creating at the moment we're going to add on to it later on so we need to link that admin form into our existing front end form one so on the main front end form one double click on the admin button which is on there so form one at the moment is the front end screen for our application we've been building double click on this admin button and you need to add this code here so when they click the admin button it's just going to go to the login form because we need them to actually get uh, to that form which we've already built in a previous lesson and get them to log in with the admin user ID and password so we can verify they are the administrator obviously before we take them to the admin screen so we did that little bit of code there just to show the login form when you click the admin button that all worked fine and the login form comes up like this so that part is all good and done but we have some more work to do so on that login form that just came up for the user ID and password you need to double click in that to go into its existing code and part of the code in there at the moment is that if the boolean user has been found so if they've looked up the user in the user details xml file found that the user id and password they're typing in matches up okay they're a registered legitimate user um, we're just going to change it it used to just have take them through to the uh, tennis dream team main menu screen here but we're going to make it conditional now we're going to have an if end if inside that existing code so we're just saying if the text user id on the screen as long as it's not equal to the admin one that just means they're a regular user who has successfully logged on so they get to go to the dream team main menu else so this will happen when the admin user id has been typed in admin and they've got the right password for it then we can uh, just close the current login form we're on just hide it and go to the admin form so we can hide this current password form and open up the admin form because they are the administrator with the correct password and so we can let them in there so we need to do that so find the section of code where it says if boolean user found in the existing login form vb program and just change this section here so it looks exactly like it is on this screen okay so when we test that what happens is if we log in and we're just a regular user like shazza and she puts in her password shaz shaz 999 and we've clicked the i button there to open it up so you can actually see what she's typed in well then because she's in the user details file there she is shazza shaz shaz 999 and that's what you put in the screen so that all matches up when it does the search it takes it to the tennis dream team main menu and that works quite okay if the administrator logs on uh, with admin geronimo 77 and that is the correct password at the moment that's in the user details file for the admin user id well then they won't be taken to that normal screen they'll be taken to the new administration screen and that's what the screen will look like when it's fully built but remember at the moment we've just got the heading on and the one label there okay so that's that now if the user uh accidentally messes up their password or if they're not a registered user bazza is in the user details file now his password is b-a-z-z-a bazza boy one two three four but you can see barry's messed it up here he's put in bazza boy one two three four okay he's got double a instead of double z so the passwords don't match up so it's not going to let him log in all right so that's still working and if someone tries to hack in as the administrator they've put admin here but they haven't got the correct password they're just trying out administrator one two three uh whereas the geronimo 77 is what's needed so that won't be correct so it won't let them into that admin form so we've linked that all up and it's working really well so that's all good and that's a section of our work completed so now we're going to make the data set and the data table that's going to relate to the existing applicants xml file and so there's a series of steps we have to do but it's critically important you take a look at that applicants xml file and these names that we're going to create using the ide they have to match up so we have to call our data set we're going to make in visual basic an internal data set in memory for the records to go into it has to be called ds applicants and the data table we make to go inside that data set has to be called dtab applicant 
all right? Otherwise it won't work and it won't actually cause an error or a program crash. What will happen is that it just won't read in the data. So you just uh, have clicked the button, started up, but nothing will be showing up uh, on the screen. Okay, so, and even if you try and correct these names later on, that doesn't work already because it's kind of made this binding source thing already behind the scenes and so it doesn't fix that up as well. And also the field names that we're using here in the XML file, best to use the exact same field names when we set up the data table. Okay, so just keep that in mind. These names that are in the XML file that you're trying to build an internal memory data table for, uh, they need to match up identically exactly be the same. So there's eight steps here. So step one of eight and we did these back in the uh, XML writing records lesson. But the first thing is where your project is in the Solution Explorer up the top right hand corner. Right click on the project name then go to add and we need to add a new item. All right. Now what will happen then is a screen will come up and you can pick lots and lots of different uh, types of visual basic items. The one we want is data set. So you might have to scroll down to get to that. So we want data set. And the thing is when we name it, it needs to be named dsapplicants.xsd, but this part must be dsapplicants so that it matches up with the name in the XML file. If you don't match them up exactly, further down the track when we test this, it's not gonna work. So remember, you've got to use those identical names. That's essential. All right, now how do I know that? Because I messed up and didn't make one of the names quite right and my thing didn't work and I had to start again and make the whole data table. So just remember, get them exactly right. So now what will happen now is that when you say add, it'll come to this screen and you'll have your data sources open and this will appear here and we need to drag a data table is what we want. So you just uh, hold it down with your left mouse button, drag it out onto the work area. Then we need to rename it and we need to rename it to dtab applicant, okay? because in the XML file, uh, it was called DTAB applicant. And that's where I messed mine up. I think I called it DTAB applicants or something. And then later on when I got to testing, nothing worked. No errors, nothing bad happening with the program. It's just that I couldn't get any data um, into that kind of data grid uh, spreadsheet type thing on the screen. So very important to be careful as you're doing these steps. All right, so uh, once we've got the data table created and it's kind of hidden behind these boxes here. So it is on the screen, it's called DTAB applicant, but we've right clicked on it and gone add column. And the shortcut for that is control L to add columns, but we're adding our first column. And remember we went back to the XML file and got these field names exactly as they were from the XML file. And they all need to be set to system string. Okay, so the first one is Apple registered. So we put that one in. Apple registered and when you put it in here, uh, what will happen in the properties on the right hand side of your screen is the name will automatically come up Apple registered and that's all we need to do. It should default it to system string which is what we want. Uh, so all you need to do is type the name in here and just check out it works all right. Then you're ready to do the first one Apple name. So the quick way is just press control and L. I'll bring up a new blank one of these boxes and you can put Apple name in. So we're using the same names as the XML file. And when we're finished, we should have these same field names in our DTAB applicant in our data table we're making for Visual Basic's internal memory. Uh, should be exactly the same names as were in the XML file and everything's going to be good. Now, step six, we've got all that set up. So we need to save it now. So make sure you click the save all, the double disks here or just do file save all uh, from up in the left hand corner. And then once your project's saved, you can close this guy down just using the X and that'll be saved all right. And if you go to Solution Explorer, you'll now see that you have a data set called dsapplicants.xsd as part of your solution. And if you wanted to go back and change things, you can double click on this and it'll reopen up data sources for you. So that data table setup is now all completed. Now look, you can do that using program code. And if you want to Google for that sort of thing and look at some YouTube videos, look at Stack Overflow, you can find ways of doing it. 
per personally, I just like doing it on the screen where I can see everything laid out and see exactly what's happening step by step and get it right. Because look, it's a 4GL language and you get these great tools as part of the IDE, the interface development environment. So you might as well use those tools that are there and not just have to program everything all the time. But anyway, that's the way I look at it. Now we've got to get that data table out onto the form. So I've got an admin form that's just got a heading and one label at the moment. And what we need to do is get a data table we've made out onto there. So we go view up the top here, other windows and data sources. Now it's very important, of course, that we have the admin form that we've been working on. That must be open in Visual Basic first before you do this. If you've got that guy closed, uh, this is you won't be able to do anything, okay? So the form has to be opened up, then you go view other windows data sources. And with data sources, that'll come up on the left-hand side of your screen, and there's some little arrows here. It'll just show DS applicants. You need to click these little arrows on the left to kind of open things up and get the data table open, and then click the arrow next to that so that you can see all of these um, fields here which are in the data table as well. All right, so step three, we've got our data table there, DTAB applicant. And this time we're gonna use a data grid view, which is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. When we did the writing XML lesson, we used details, uh, which gave us a kind of a mini form. But this time I'm gonna do data grid view instead. So you need to use the arrow next to that and click on data grid view, because when we finish it, not right now, it won't look like this, but when we finish it and get it out on the form, yeah, it's gonna look like a data grid view, which is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, which is a nice, neat way uh, to display this data. All right, so now we've got it set up as data grid view. We just get on DTAB applicant there, make sure it's highlighted and drag it with your mouse onto the screen. And what should happen is on the screen, uh, the data table should appear in a box like this and it is in data grid view, okay? So we need to just drag it out onto the screen. And the thing is that as well as all those fields in the Excel, it also adds a navigation bar, but it puts it right up the top of the form. And if we look at the save icon, that is kind of disabled for some reason when it first builds it. Now we want that to be enabled uh, because we will be saving things later on when we do the part two lesson of uh, this admin form. So just right click on that and just make sure it's set to enabled. And when you do that, what should happen is you'll see it now is lit up and you can see the blue disk icon on your form. So we just need to enable that save button. That's another little job there to do at step five. Step six, now that navigation bar, we don't want it stuck up the top of the form there because later on we're going to have a second navigation bar for our form that's going to be underneath uh, this data grid. So we want to put that down near the data grid. So we did this in a previous lesson, but basically what you need to do is click onto that nav bar and there's a tiny, tiny little arrow in the top right hand corner of it that points to the left and you click on that and then this uh, panel will open up and there's a drop down list next to doc, but it's not actually a drop down list. It kind of brings up this picture of what your form looks like and you can have your uh, nav bar up the top in this section of the form like it is at the moment or put it in the middle. We want to be able to move it around. So you actually need to click on none. So with that drop down list, it doesn't bring down a list of names. It brings a picture of your screen. You need to click on none, which is at the bottom. And that way it should now be disabled. So we can use these dots, these four dots gripper at the very left of that guy to click on it and get on the gripper with our mouse. And we should be able to move it around the screen. So what we've done here is we've moved it around the screen and shortened it to length. And so instead of being up the top of the screen, our nav bar is now down here. We've also kind of dragged out our spreadsheet to make it big enough for us to see things when we run the program. And we've um, got our colors, hot track here, I think. Uh, hot track is that background color so it matches the rest of the system. Uh, steel blue is the background color of that label if you haven't done that yet onto it. Uh, font sizes, we're just using 10, 12, 14, and 24. Now, don't put a white group box around here. Um, it looks much better if you put all this stuff in a group box and link the nav bar up with the spreadsheet. But the problem is that 
Putting a white group box will make the font color white, so you'll have white writing in these white boxes and you won't be able to see it. Because that happened to us, we had a, um, a group box around it, okay, and we were running our thing and it seemed to be reading the file because this would expand to have, I think, four records in it or three records, but they'd all look as though they were blank. But then we noticed when we clicked in them and highlighted them, they actually had data in them. And it was all because of, um, this group box around it. If you have the other format with text boxes, text boxes are all right, because you can set the four color of them to black. But in this data grid view, you can't go to those boxes and set their four color as black. They will inherit the color of the group box that they put inside of it, which we want to make white to match the form. And so they'll have white font and you can't change it. They don't like have a four color property you can change. So don't put a group box around there. You're going to have problems. Now, this is not the final admin form. This is just kind of the top half of it. Uh, but we'll be doing those additions later in the lesson. So holy dooly, there we go. We've set up our data set, our data table. We've got a data grid view of it out on the form. Now we just need something that can read the XML file of applicants and pop them into that data grid view so that we can actually see them on the form. And that's the next thing we're doing. And we don't need a lot of code to do it, which is a really nice thing. From building that data set and that data table, all we need to do is define what the name of the file is. And it's copied into our bin debug folder of our project, just like it was in previous lessons. So it should already be there because you're continuing on from the previous lesson we were doing about the new applicants um, application form. So yeah, that should already be in there and it should find it all right. And we just have uh, the form load process. So if you double click anywhere in that hot track blue background of the admin form, it should bring up this, this admin form load routine. And in there, remember, we need to just check that the file exists, make sure it's there. And if it does, we just use a read XML method and we can get that applicant's XML file and bang, just read the whole file into that data set we've made called dsapplicants.xsd. So it's just going to read it all straight in there. Um, yeah, if it, it doesn't find the file, then that's a problem. So we need to tell them with a message that it wasn't found. So when we run the program and test this code, we don't get any errors, but we don't get any records either. Um, the thing just stays blank uh, like it was previously. And this actually turns out to be a XML namespace problem. And that's what we're gonna look at next. So when you build something with the IDE and you're making a data set and data tables and getting it out on your form and it all looks beautiful, uh, the XML file that's read in has to have a namespace in it. And the namespace for this one needs to be HTTP temp URI, which means it's a temporary uniform resource identifier, then .org and then slash dsapplicants.xsd because that's the name of the data set we've defined uh, within VBNet. All right, so we've got to get that into our file, uh, that name, otherwise it doesn't work, okay? So at the moment, see this is our file here and it's just got DS applicants and that all works fine if you're using XML docs like we were in the previous lesson, but this time we're using XML data sets and it's a different story. So we can fix it. We have to very carefully get Windows Notepad and open it up. We're just viewing it at the moment in the Edge browser here because it's a lot easier to see. But you need to open up Notepad and then where it's got DS applicants here and this right hand arrow, in that gap there, we need to type XMLNS equals for XML namespace equals, and you've got to have that HTTP you know, double slash temperial DS applicants, applicants.xsd. So if you make that change and save the file using Notepad, of course, because you can't do it here in Edge that we're using to display it, well, then things work okay. So we added that XMLNS uh, namespace into there and then bang, suddenly everything's okay. And it will read our applicants, these people from the last lesson, Jasmine, Tiana, and Joey, it will read them 
into there. Plus uh, underneath here, there's a few more that we were playing around with for practice, okay? But I think you also just show those three uh, from the first Pre from the previous lesson where we actually added some applicants. Now, we've got registered users as well, Barry and Sharon. Now, they need to have an entry in the original applicants file. We kind of built um, the login with Barry and Sharon before we did an applicants file, but we kind of need to retrofit them into the applicants file. And they need to be set to registered equals true because they've already been registered. We don't need the system administrator to look at their application and figure out should I register them or should I reject them. Um, they're already registered. So we have to set their registered equals to true. Now, if we try and retro add Barry Johnson using that new user application form and put in some details for him and give him his user ID of Baza, um, it were errors out. It says that user ID is not available because it's already being used by another user, which is perfectly what we want it to do. Because remember, we put validation into this screen, which we built in the previous program, to check out the user details file and make sure there wasn't someone already with that uh, user ID. And there is. There is, of course, Barry Johnson is already in there. So we'll have to kind of temporarily change it, like just make it Baza one year. And then after it's made, the entry in the applicants file, we can just edit the applicants file and change it back to Baza. All right, so that's what we did. We just uh, had our applicants file and after Joey Peterson, we just uh, used that screen to add in Baza 1, but then we just changed it back here to Baza by editing it in Windows Notepad. And <clears throat> yep, that's what we've done. And we also notice that uh, Joey, who's a new user, hasn't been registered yet. His Apple registered is false. But because Barry's already registered and in this user details file along with Shazza, because they're both already registered users that are using the system, we've just manually changed again with Windows Notepad. Instead of that being false, we've just changed it to be true and done the same thing for Sharon. For Shazza, we've set it to be true. So that's all good. We've now retro fitted them to the applicant's file. And so now it kind of makes sense. The system has integrity and everything matching up. They were original applicants. They got approved. So their Apple registered change to true because they're a registered applicant. And because of that, they got added into the user details file. So that's all good. Um, so we've done that all okay and edited it up with Notepad. It's all looking beautiful. However, uh-oh. Don't like howevers. And there always is a however. And what is the however this time? If we have a close look at our two new records for Barry and Sharon, they've got this XMLNS stuff in them and XML namespace equal to blank. So what should happen is we should just have DTAB applicant and that's it because up further in um, the DS applicants, we set up that temp URI as the namespace which it needs to have so it can interact with the data set and data table that are on the form. But all of a sudden, uh, the processing here wants to make a blank XMLNS whenever we uh, make a new record. Now, is that going to be a problem or is it just going to be okay and we can leave it there? Well, when we use that admin function to now read the applicants into that top spreadsheet file, we only get our first three, Jasmine, Tiana, Barlow and Joey from the previous lesson and Barry and Sharon that we just added into there and we could see them in there, but they had this XMLNS equals spaces on them, a blank XML namespace. So they're just not read in, they've been ignored and we don't get any message. We don't get any error. We don't get any system crash. Uh, all that happens is that they're just not there because they've got a different namespace than the rest of the file. Okay. And we've got to fix that problem, but you know, all problems can be fixed and this will be okay. So look, the whole XML namespacing though, when you go and Google it, when you look at Stack Overflow, if you try and find YouTube videos on it, 
it just looks incredibly complicated. And look, there's hours and hours of reading you could do about it. But look, here's a summary kind of what of, of what it's about, trying to really simplify it and break it down for what we need in our program. So for the internal memory data sets containing the data tables we set up, so we want to have these data sets and data tables so we can make those beautiful data grid views on the form. Uh, we need to have a namespace that has this temp, temp URI, URI um, dot org slash ds then you have to have the name of the xml file so because ours is called applicants um, you know dot xml we had to make sure our uh, our data set was called uh, applicants dot xsd and so in here you'd have ds applicants dot xsd later on we do the user details file this will need to be ds user details dot xsd okay so why do they have this what's with this internet kind of address type thingy here of http um look the idea of having this namespace is that this is tagged on to all of the fields in the record as well so that if we had um two files like a, let's see, if we had a, a kind of a stock file of what we've got in stock and that had a stock item and then we had another file of uh, things on customers orders and that had a stock item number as well. So we could tell which stock item number was which. Uh, we would have to give each of those files namespaces so that VBNet knows, oh, this stock code here, oh, this actually came from the inventory file of what we've got in stock at the moment. Um, it's not one that came off an order, all right? And also you could actually pull XML files off the internet to read into your program uh, back in Windows 8. But look, it seems now that Windows 10 and the newer versions of VB, that seems to have got incredibly complex. When you watch some video where a guy did a real roundabout way of doing it and he could actually get at an HTTP uh, XML file which he had on the internet. So all of this stuff has sort of been set up in VB. It's extra complicated stuff we don't need. We're not going to read our files off the internet or do anything like that. But we do need to actually consider these namespaces and we're going to have to do some work in our program to make sure everything, everything has one of these tempuri.org type namespaces on it. All right. Otherwise things won't work. So in the applicant's XML file, we need to carefully modify that so that after where DS applicants is, we need to type in carefully XMLNS, XML namespace equals this name, which is needed. Okay. And in this one, because it's applicants XML, this is called DS applicants because that's what we made our data set in Visual Basic in. So we just put pop that in the top and you should be able to copy and paste it here from the PDF download that you get for this lesson. Uh, so that needs to just go into there very carefully and resave the file. And when you look at it using Edge, you should see quite clearly that that's in there and Edge will highlight it in red because it's kind of an important thing and a big deal. But we've now got a namespace specified for that file. So that's really good. And for Bazaar and Shazza, where we ran and got those uh, blank namespaces put onto their records, we need to carefully open this up in Notepad and just backspace to get rid of those, okay? So bring this right hand arrow all the way back so it's just immediately after the T like on this top record. So we need to get rid of those two blank namespaces and save the file, okay? And then they should just look like DTAB applicant, Barry, DTAB applicant, Sharon. And once you've made those fixes, what should happen is that they will be read in to the admin screen. So when you run the process and get onto the admin screen, there they are, Barry Johnson and Sharon. So that's all working now, okay? So we've kind of fixed what we made, but how do we kind of future-proof this for when new applicants are added to stop that blank namespace getting in? Because it'll be pretty crazy if we have to edit the file every time to get rid of blank namespaces. All right, so in the user application form, we need to now go to the code for that form, all right? So make sure you're in the right program doing the right thing. There's a subroutine there at the moment where we write out the new applicant. And as per the commentary here, this is what we need to do. So first thing is we need to dim 
a variable called namespace universal resource identifier. So we're just dimming that as string and we're putting in the namespace that we need, which is in the top um, part of that XML file, if you remember, okay? The file we're gonna to write to applicants.xml. We've manually edited that into there. So that's the namespace components in that file need to get. So first in the write out new applicant, we need to add that extra line in to dim a variable called namespace URI. Now what we need to do is when we write out and create each X new XML element, for the new record that's gonna be appended or added onto the end of that file, we need to not only say what the name of uh, the field is, right? Apple registered Apple name, but we need to put comma namespace URI. And that way, uh, what'll happen is that it'll realize these elements here already belong to that namespace um, that's there, this one here, which is up the top of the XML file. So it won't try and create a new namespace for them that's blank, because it'll see, hey, here's this field, uh, here's this record, and look, here's fields and stuff, but they all belong to that namespace URI, that one which is up the top of the folder, the uh, up the top of the XML file. So you don't need to go adding in VB, you don't need to go adding in any blank namespaces. But anyway, if you put this in carefully and code it, make sure you do the commas, comma space namespace URI, and make sure you have this bit right. And don't worry about the underlining, that's just something um, VBNet puts into it. It doesn't have to be taken away or anything. It works fine with that there. And what'll happen now when you test it is that if we get a new one, so we're doing another guy here, Dougie Dimwit, uh, Dim guy at Hotmail, because he doesn't really know why he wants to join. I think this guy's gonna get his application rejected by the system administrator when we get to part two of this lesson, adding in the functions to look through the prospective applicants and decide whether to add them on or not. I think Dougie Dimwitz messed up his application, he's not gonna get on. But look, the record has been lodged successfully, which means it should have been written to the file. And when we run the admin system, we can see that there's a false one, which means this is a new boy applying, Dougie Dimwit here, and we can see all of his data, okay? So making those changes in that applicant uh, module, so that it's aware of the namespace for the items when we add a new record onto the end, like Dougie Dimwit. That fixes everything up, so that's all good. And so we've done that bit of our process. All right, finally, we've got all the applicant stuff working. We had to go back and kind of fix some things up as well in our previous lessons program, just to make it fit in with this new data set, data table setup we've got that requires an XML namespace with a temp URI um, sort of a label for it. Okay, so we've got all of that fixed up and now we can finally work on the bottom half of that admin form where we're gonna be putting up the user details for the users that are already registered like Barry and Sharon. Okay, so this one here, the namespace we're gonna to need to set up for this one is the same sort of thing, but for the .xsd file, our one's gonna be called dsusers, okay? Because when you go into the XML file for the user details.xmls, the um, first highest level is called dsusers because we kind of knew we were gonna be making a data set for this later on, so we called it dsusers. Uh, look, if you didn't do that and it was just called users, um, that would be fine, but you'd have to make sure that the XSD file you make is called users.xsd, okay? So it's just standard kind of naming convention to have the data set name here, and each record is a member of a data table, so you put a dtab name here or dtable name. But just make sure that whatever names you have decide to use in your file, they always have to match up, um, and we've got to have that XML namespace in there. So with Windows Notepad, obviously not with Microsoft Edge, you would carefully edit that in, the HTTP temp URI, and this one's gonna be dsusers.xsd. So we're gonna change our user details file to have that heading in it already and save that, and it's gonna be in the bin debug, so we won't have those problems later on, which we had with the applicants one. Um, Right, now because we've changed the file, actually we better check that we're not gonna have any problems. So we're gonna re 
regression test the add new applicant program because there's a part of that which searches through the files remember when we we're trying to put Barry in it said oh Barry's already an existing user you're not allowed to use him um, yeah there is a part of that which searches the user details file now we've put just put a namespace into that so that may mess up this search back in this program so we need to kind of go backwards and retest it and just make sure we haven't broken anything and that it's no longer working so when we go back uh, what will happen is that someone like Jazzy is in the applicants file uh, there's a new user here Jasmine regression test so she wants to use the ID of Jazzy and the systems let her do it it's just skipped ahead now to password and saying hey you got to type in a password so it's been quite happy to accept Jazzy and doesn't realize that Jazzy is already a user ID that's been taken by someone else because Jasmine Lennox remember way back in the last lesson in this applicants file where we've added this um, heading now this namespace uh, she's already there so it shouldn't be letting someone else use the same user id that's a disaster so the file search which used to work in this program is now broken uh, because we've put this namespace because we've added namespaces um, into our xml files the previous stuff working off xml doc and not data sets no longer works and we need to fix it up so it will work all right so yeah that's what we we're talking about like if you had two different um things like a customer xml file and supplier xml file and you want to have email addresses in both of them uh yeah if you just call them email how does uh, vbnet know which is which well they have namespaces in each of those files so this email relates to that namespace which is that file and the other one relates to the other namespace which is the other file so these namespaces help vbnet keep track of things when you've got fields that are the same name in two different files or data sets which you've got happening in memory at the moment so we need to um process some stuff using namespace manager coding so this is another part of namespace we need to use namespace manager when we're going to do these searches of xml files previously they worked fine because we we're just reading them into an xml doc we got it to some search code it was all working beautifully when we finished the applicant's lesson because we're now introducing data tables and data sets and they require xml namespaces we put the namespaces in but the stuff that was working with xml doc won't work anymore and we need to do some fixing all right so where we do the fixing in the um, applicants xml file search part of the add new user program so you need to go to user application form make sure you're in the program for that one and we need to add this code here so previously we just had some simple code that we were building this xml node list and once you've got the node list of all the fields that are in the file you can just search through the node list and find a user id really quickly um, but the node list making doesn't work anymore as we saw someone put jazzy in it searched but jazzy should have been there and found but she wasn't so this old code isn't working the way we made the node list isn't working because all of the fields now have a namespace associated with them so we've got to bring that into the processing so what we do is we just uh, dim a variable which we just call namespace universal resource identifier for applicants and rather than hard code that http temp urids applicants.xsd because we put that in the file up the top uh, you can just read it out of the file and the way we do that is we just say okay go to that xml apps doc and just get the document element and grab the namespace uri that's in there okay so rather than hard coding that we can do it quicker this way and then we have to make a xml namespace manager so we're just calling this one manager number one and we're calling the namespace here that we add into that manager ns1 and that's going to be this guy here which it's pulling out of the file and then when we make our node list we just instead of using this old code which is broken now and doesn't work you just have to um put in the same sort of thing about selecting your nodes to make your node list but they have to be prefixed here like slash ns1 so it picks up that um, ds applicants now has a namespace kind of applied to it so it'll say okay yeah the applicants xsd one i need to grab that and i need to grab that 
and then you'll be fine. It'll actually build your node list okay. And then the existing search code we here had here just to go through the node list we built, that will just work fine and that doesn't need any changing. So basically we used to have a one liner here which is in this blue box and we've just commented out so we could leave it there to show you. That one's no good, need to get rid of that and you need to put this new coding in here which uses an XML namespace manager. And when you do that, that'll be fine. But we also need to do the second search because after that it does a search, builds another node list and it searches the um, user details file where Barry and Sharon are, Bazza and Shazza, in case a new user was trying to use the user ID of Bazza or Shazza who are already registered users um, in the user details file. So down in that search routine, uh, we just do the exact same thing, same sort of coding. The blue code's out of the picture that's gone now and we've replaced it with this. It should build a node list properly using the namespace, using the... Um, the users which we read into an XML document in this particular uh, program rather than reading it into a data table. And that should all work now and that search should be all good. So I think we're just up to testing that. So testing the namespace, um, Tess here, she's decided she wants to use that user idea Jazzy. It's such a popular user idea. It's pretty cool, isn't it, Jazzy? Uh, but anyway, it says user idea is already being used by another user. So we're back to everything working. It has found Jasmine, uh, the original Jasmine who's in the applicants file and it's letting Tess here take away her user ID that she's picked. So Tess will have to use a different one. So she picks fast cars, but I think that's already belongs to one of the applicants that's in the file. So it says, no, nope, that's already being used by another user. And then um, Tess decides that, well, my name, my dad's name's Bazza. Maybe I'll just use my dad's name, Bazza, and choose that as my user ID. But again, she's told, no, that's already being used by another user because Bazza, who's a registered user, not an applicant, registered user in the other file, he's using that one. Come on, Tess, pick one which isn't already in use. So she decides she'll use um, Shazza and her mum's name and that's no good either because that's already being used. Um, so that's all good. It's blocking her from using anything in the applicants file and in the user details file. And if she does change that to like Shazza, um, Shazza B or Shazza Girl or something, then it'll be fine and she'll be able to get herself a user ID. Uh, now we also need to um, do some more regression testing. So we've tested the new user applicant screen, but you know how we had that password login screen? Um, that's also searching the user details file, searching for people like Bazza or Shazza that already have a password in the system to verify they're already registered and let them log on. Um, because we've added that namespace up the top, I think you can guess what's going to be happening in that part. So what happens is Bazza, whose password is Bazzaboy1234, and we've turned it on here with the eye. Uh-oh, Bazza's user details suddenly aren't found uh, in the user details file because we added this namespace and the user ID and password of Bazza are now associated with a namespace. This old fashioned searching, which just use XML doc and no namespace has stopped working. Okay. And just needs a quick little fix put into it with namespace manager, the same way we did the other fix. All right. So it's the exact same sort of thing. Make sure you go into the login form program and where it does the searching and checking this out here above that we would have just had this one liner in blue which was going to build our xml node list to search through that no longer works because we've got a namespace associated with the file so we just need to do that same sort of stuff make ourselves a manager um, have the correct namespace this is the dsusers.xsd for this one and then that will all be good and that will work all right and we should test that. So Bazza and Bazzaboy1234, it now knows about the namespace through that manager code we added and he'll be okay. He can log on and he can get to the Dennis Tennis Dream Team main menu. Alrighty. So you might want to take a break here, like we've been going 48 minutes and that's why we've divided this into part one and part two because it's great to have this data grid view 
on there and to use um, data sets and data tables and have our navigator bars and stuff. But it comes at a price. You have to use start getting into XML namespaces. And look, it's okay because we've got the fixes for it. You just need to go back and retrofit the using of a namespace into the other two programs we'd written. The program that puts up the login and password screen, the user ID and password. We had to go back and fix that so that the search in it knew about namespaces through a manager and that could work all right. And we had to go back to the new applicant um, program and make some changes in that, all right? But look, the cost of just doing that code and testing it uh, for the benefit of getting a really great administration form is definitely well worth it. So we're finally um, ready to go back and work on finishing off the admin screen form. And like we said, take a break now, maybe come back, do this another time, even wait till tomorrow. You can use the uh, timeline index in the YouTube video um, to continue on. So if you've built it this far, uh, just stop and have a break and kind of make yours a part 1A and a part 1B for the way you're learning it. All right, I've forgotten to bring a drink of water into the studio here, so I can't have a drink. Uh, bad move. I've actually got this kind of little checklist thing here that I have. Make sure you do all this stuff when you're going to make a video. And I obviously need to add on to that. I uh, better put in big letters here that I need water. <laughs> okay, first time I've ever forgotten to. <laughs> and my mouth is as dry as the beach down the road well it's not down the road it's about a 15 minute bike ride away but anyway let's keep going suck it up and keep going all right so we've got to have this um data set and data ta table for the other file the user details file and there's eight steps to do just like we did for the application form uh, application file and these are going to be done on the admin form but in step four rather than make a data grid view we're going to kind of make this little data table form view instead so look we won't go through this in great detail because we already did all of this stuff pretty much the same for the applicants so step one you've got to click on your solution add a new item this one because we're doing the users file and it's called ds users make sure you call it ds users.xsd pick the type data set click on add when you add it drag your data table out there this one needs to be called dtab users because in the xml file underneath ds users the records are called dtab users so this data table must have the same name as in the xml file or that's not going to work and then you go through those steps there of getting the required fields in user number user name user id is a primary key um, so that needed a little bit of setting up where you set that unique was true on that particular one. So when you do user ID, you set unique true and that'll cause this primary key to be there. If you forgot to do it, just click on user ID, go to the properties and where it says unique, make sure that's set to true because we want it to enforce that no two people can have the same user ID and then we save it all and do all that. And then in our project Solution Explorer, we'll see we've got DS applicants, the one we made before. Now we've got DS users as well, .xsd. So that's finished. So we need to get it back out onto the form. So same steps as usual, except when we get to this one, we're not doing data grid view to make a spreadsheet like we did for the applicants. So it's not gonna look like this, okay? Instead, we're picking details, which will give a VB type form. So make sure when you do this step uh, that you pick details, don't pick data grid view this time through. And same old thing, drag it out onto the form, but you won't get a data grid. Now you'll get kind of this cool little form that's already got the names here because we set up captions when we set up each of our items in the data table. That was something we probably should have mentioned. Let's just sit back to where we did that. Yeah, see we've got user number, user name, caption, user space name. So you have to fill out the caption. So when you do use a number, you need to click in properties and make sure caption uh, you change to user space number, all right? Because by making all those little captions for the four fields, it makes life a lot easier and quicker when you do this dragging out bit because you'll already have user space number, user space name. If you forgot to do it, it's okay. You could go back in and change these labels anyway. But uh, that's kind of made that and that's all nice. And then 
That one though, remember when the um, data grid view came out, it automatically had the navigator bar and all we had to do is enable the save icon on it. Uh, this one here doesn't automatically get a navigator bar. So we're gonna have to make our own navigator bar, which is quite easy. If you close down the data sources tab and in the normal toolbox, there's a thing called a binding navigator. And that's the thing you need to drag out onto the form. And straight away, it's gonna pop up to the very top of the form, uh, just like that other one did. So it'll be up the top of the form. Remember, you click that little arrow there, click this down arrow on dock and make the docking none. Then you'll be able to grab that four dots gripper and move it down into this position, okay? But when you have a quick, quick look at it or a detailed look, compared with the one above it, it doesn't have a save button. It's got all the other things we need, but it doesn't have that save button. So that's the next thing we're gonna fix up. All right, so when you drag a binding navigator out, it will go up the top. We just do that fiddling around like we did last time with the docking none. Then we can move it down to here. And our next step is to get a um, save thing. But before we do that, there's another step. We need to relate this navigator to the data, which is this data set here, which remember down the bottom of your form, it'll have all these things and it's got DS users. That's a data set we made that this data table came out of. And it's got this data table user binding source, okay, which is linking up the data set and the data table and all the fields and stuff. And we need to have this binding navigator. We need to tell VB, hey, that relates to these guys down here and I want to use it to flick through these records. So that's called the binding source. So click onto your navigator bar and in its properties on the right hand side, go to binding source and use the drop down arrow there. And you need to make sure that it gives you the DTAB users binding source, this one. And then you don't accidentally do it on the applicant one, okay? So you gotta use that drop down arrow, make sure this nav bar gets linked up to this one, the users, okay? So DTAB users binding source, that's really important. We gotta link that up to this actual data table, all right, by using binding source. All right, now we can do the save button bit. So again, we click on our nav bar, which is here, that little baby arrow up the top right hand corner that points left, click on that, but we're not doing dock this time. You click insert standard items. Now what that'll do is it'll give you all of the missing items. We've got our save button we want, but we've also got printer and scissors and question mark and all sorts of stuff here. These ones we don't want. Uh, so you just right click on them and press the delete button on your keyboard. So if you right click, click and press delete. Um, all of these, if you click on them and press delete, you can get rid of them all, but don't get rid of the save one. Get rid of the piece of paper, the folder, all the other things except save. And when you've done that, it should look like this. So we'll have a save icon in there and it is enabled. So we don't have to right click and do enabling on it. So now we've custom built our own little nav bar and we've linked it into that data table. So that's really good. And that's another new skill we've learnt in this lesson. Alrighty, so now if we just change the form a bit. Now this one you can put a group box around because these are text boxes, they can have their own four color property which is set to black. So you'll be able to read the black writing in the white box. But the data table we've made white to match the rest of the form. And that's okay, you can have a group box around the data table and navigator bar for this guy. But if you do it for this guy, it messes it up because the writing in here will be white and inherits the writing color from the group box. Because remember these little boxes in here don't have a four color, so we can't override them and set them to black. Okay, so no group box up here, but a nice group box down here to group it all together and make it look nice and neat. And now we just need some um, code to read stuff into that user details data set. So same thing as we did for the applicants, actually just make sure it links up to the user details XML file, which is in the bin debug folder and same code, this code here, but it's just changed to read the user details file instead 
and put that into that DS users, that data set for the users, which we made in VB. And when we test that out, woohoo, now we've got all our applicants up the top here and you can flick down the list or use the scroll bar over here to see all of them. And we've got all the registered users like Barry. And if you use this right arrow button here, you'll next you'll see Shaz, Sharon or Shazza. And after that, you'll see the admin um, login. So we've got our user details, uh, XML is displaying beautifully in this little form box with a navigator bar and stuff. And this one's in its spreadsheet view, data grid view up the top. And so that I think is just about part one done. Now, yeah, let's just go back up for a minute. So yeah, this is as far as we're going with part one. We've set it all up. We had to do all that retro fixing because of XML namespaces, but at least we've learned about them now. We understand them and know what they're all about and how to fix any issues we have when we use XML document for some things in memory and we use data sets and data tables for other things in memory. We can get them talking to each other and everyone's good friends and our data all works okay, okay? And that's where we're finishing here because look, the video is already nearly one hour long, so that's quite enough for, for one lesson. Um, the next part could take another 40 minutes, so maybe it's going to take another hour. We don't know yet because we haven't actually um, designed up the lesson. Uh, but this is what we're going to do in the next part. The things we still need to add on. We need to sort that data grid view so all the false unprocessed people are up the top and Barry and Sharon are already registered in that spreadsheet data grid view there down the bottom. Uh, we need to get those plus and save icons uh, for adding a new user. We've got to get them set up so they'll actually save a new user out to the user details XML file when the administrator types in their details. Um, once someone is um, registered and added onto that file in the applicants in that spreadsheet view we need to be able to set their Apple registered value to true and save that out to the applicants file and we also need to have a facility for if someone's rejected so we'll set them to fail okay because we've got true false and we'll have fail like that um, who was it? Dougie Dimwit or someone's going to get rejected because he had a silly excuse for wanting to join that didn't make any sense. And we're also going to have another function where we'll have a multi-line text box on that admin form and we'll drag all this data into it that's going to pretty much format up what the um, email is to send out to someone who's been accepted and registered into the user details file just to say, yeah, hey, we accepted you. You're on there now. This is your user ID. This is the password and um, good luck and away you go and email us if you have any problems. So we'll be setting that up so that he'll just be able, the administrator, he or she, sorry, he or she, the administrator, will be able to um, kind of highlight the text in that little text box, control C, and then they can have their email open, Gmail, Hotmail, uh, Outlook, whatever they're using and copy and paste it into there uh, quickly and get the email address out of the applicant, spreadsheet up the top, paste that in and bang, just send off an email email to the successful applicants who are now added onto the system and ready to use the dream team. But that's all in the part two lesson, which should be coming up next week. So remember, we've got our whole programming course. So if you aren't sure which lessons you should have already done before doing this part one, although it's a little bit kind of late now, but where are we here? Uh, you can go to the programming course page and it's got a lot of pictures now, so they're a bit slow to log in. If we go down to where we're up to. Okay, so basically we started this um, user login thing at this lesson. So you need to have done the VB user login this lesson, and you need to have done the add new user applicant form lesson, this one. And then coming up in here soon when we finish making the resources will be this current one, administration part one. And then next week we'll have administration part two. Then this whole little XML logging in system will be finished. We'll have four lessons that have done the whole thing. But this is kind of applicable to other things. You could have um, not just users that want to log on and stuff. You could have uh, like customers, and orders and be relating them together. And yeah, so 
Yeah, let's just go back and try and explain that quickly. I know it's been a long video, but yeah, look, these, this spreadsheet here, this spreadsheet could just be all your customer details and maybe down in this bottom section, you're flicking through orders so that if there is a order for a certain customer ID, you can go up here and see who they are and know what their email address is to email them. Or maybe this could be um, uh, customers that have ordered some food from a no, maybe this is, yeah, for a customer, it's the food order they've got from some restaurant or something. And down here, you can flick through um, customer details or food prices or something like that or previous orders. OK, so this can be used for um, any kind of thing. It doesn't have to be necessarily for a password uh, administration system like we're doing. So anyway, we hope you enjoyed this video. Remember to play it at 1.5 speed, which will help you out a lot with getting through it and subscribe. Yeah. If you found this useful, make sure you give it a like and then subscribe to our channel because we're putting out videos every week and they'll be most useful to you uh, for learning how to do things in the fabulous visualbasic.net, uh, the fifth most popular language in Teobes top 10 monthly index. And that's all good. And we'll see you in the next lesson.